I'm Justin Silverman of the New England First Amendment Coalition. Thank you for viewing this important presentation on how you, journalists throughout New England, can best protect yourself and stay safe while news gathering. First, a bit about my organization. NEFAC is the region's leading advocate for the First Amendment. We help journalists and other citizens in the region through advocacy, education, and defense. Please visit NEFAC.org to learn more about how we're helping communities like yours throughout New England. Also, a special thanks to the Society of Professional Journalists New England chapter for its help coordinating this presentation. You can learn more about SPJ New England at spjne.org. As for our program today, we have four very knowledgeable and experienced guests who are going to help us understand the threats faced by journalists and how we can best respond. So some brief introductions. First, Molly Hennessy Fisk. Molly is a staff writer at the Los Angeles Times where she's worked since 2006. She now serves as the paper's Houston bureau chief. Molly was tear gassed by police earlier this year while covering protests in Minnesota, despite identifying herself as a journalist. She's going to share her experience with us and provide some tips for journalists covering similar demonstrations. Molly, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Next, we have Dan McFadden. Dan is a staff attorney at the ACLU of Massachusetts. He has extensive experience litigating a broad range of civil rights and civil liberties issues. Dan is going to help us understand the legal protections in place for journalists when they're covering political demonstrations or facing other threats by law enforcement or members of the general public. Dan, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Next, Tara O'Neill. Tara is a reporter for Hearst Connecticut Media Group. She covers breaking news for the Connecticut Post in Bridgeport. Tara was arrested last year while covering a local protest. She's going to share her experience with us and also describe some things that she's learned that may be helpful to other journalists. Tara, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, we have Stephanie Sugars. Stephanie is a reporter for the US Press Freedom Tracker. The tracker documents press freedom violations in the US and by US officials abroad. She previously worked for the Committee to Protect Journalists and the Post Conflict Research Center. Stephanie will be giving us some perspective on the state of press freedom in this country, and she's going to be sharing with us what challenges journalists can expect moving forward. Stephanie, thank you for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So, Stephanie, I would like to start with you. Uh, we're heading into a very contentious presidential election, and we're continuing to cover political protests against racism and police brutality. Journalists throughout the country and here in New England are putting themselves in volatile situations for the sake of informing their communities. So can you provide us an overview of press freedom in the United States relative to assaults, arrests, and threats made against journalists? And give us some perspective on some trends that you've seen during recent years and the reasons for those trends. Yeah, absolutely. So this year, as you mentioned, has been very chaotic, not only because of the election and the unprecedented national protests that we've been seeing, but all of that is taking place within the coronavirus pandemic. So a little bit of context about the numbers that we've been seeing and the trends at least this year over last year. In terms of arrests, we had we documented nine journalists, including Tara, who were arrested last year and about 40 or so who were assaulted. Compare that with just since May 26, the day after George Floyd was killed. Since that day, we have documented, we've received reports of 121 journalists arrested and at least 360 assaulted. So we also have seen such an unprecedented surge that on a single day on May 30th, we received more reported aggressions against journalists than we did document in all of 2019 combined. And we've received twice, more than twice as many uh, reported aggressions than we have in our entire history. So it is certainly particularly dangerous for journalists reporting on protests this year. And we absolutely recommend that everyone utilize resources that are offered by NEFAC, our partners at CPJ and Freedom of the Press Foundation and be in touch with the ACLU and Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press 
to figure out what they can do. So some of the trends that we've been seeing are not only in regards to the protests, but we had to launch a couple of additional things that we don't normally track. Uh, we're looking at COVID harassment cases. So journalists who were out reporting in the field wearing masks or covering COVID related protests who were then harassed or threatened or assaulted because of those choices, because they're out there reporting. And we also had to launch a special section looking at election related issues where journalists are being barred from attending presidential campaign events that they normally would be allowed to attend or being removed. So with all three of those things happening in conjunction, it definitely is particularly important that this year journalists are very firm in their awareness and knowledge of their rights and go in with eyes wide open to the risks that they might be facing going about their normal deeds. So it sounds like as far as trends are concerned, we're unfortunately uh, moving upward in the instances of assaults and threats against journalists. And while these are uh, certainly concerning numbers, I, I think for uh, any non-journalists that hear them, they are just numbers and it might be hard to really relate to the stories behind uh, these incidents that you're documenting and, and really get a, a good understanding for what's happening on the ground. So uh, Molly, if we could now turn to you, uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your experience actually being on the ground and uh, reporting day to day as a journalist and in particular, your experience interacting with police uh, given the recent process in, in Minnesota. Yes, I can. And um, thanks again for having me. It's no coincidence, you know, Stephanie was mentioning May 30th and that's when, um, when the protests that I was covering happened in uh, Minneapolis, in addition to other protests, I've been covering others leading up to that day, but that's when I got um, tear gassed. Uh, I also got shot with rubber bullets in my leg, my left leg, and my colleague, a photographer was, um, she got all, you know, uh, tear gassed as well, but also pepper sprayed in her eyes. It went through her goggles and, and damaged her corneas. Luckily, um, she's recovered. A police officer uh, also threw her over a brick wall and she landed and, and was somewhat injured by that as well. So there's all sorts of injuries that we can suffer. And, and frankly, we were very lucky because um, I was not wearing a helmet. Um, I had safety glasses on, but not goggles or any kind of ballistic protection. And uh, there was another journalist uh, involved in covering that protest, a photographer who lost her eye. And there have been others who have lost their eyes or suffered more serious injuries. Um, the ACLU, I should note, um, had had sued in relation to that, um, that the protests in, in Minneapolis. And while we weren't um, plaintiffs in the suit, my colleague and I did submit evidence um, for that lawsuit and I also have a pending complaint against Minnesota State Police. So there are things that you can do to seek relief afterwards, but um, there's also a lot of practical things you can do to be better prepared, like wearing a, a helmet, which I now have, or even just a bike helmet, it's something that you can get. Um, there's all sorts of safety trainings you can do. I just did one with NAHJ, where you have a trainer who's giving you advice, but then also other journalists give advice. But security gear, um, wearing your credentials, which I did, I had a notebook in my hand and waved it. That didn't make a difference. They still, uh, the Minnesota State Patrol still attacked us, but we were um, able to, to, in hindsight, make those, those claims. And there was footage and there were recordings of us um, saying we were journalists and reporters and waving those notebooks. And so um, that was helpful. Um, having a, a security plan, a strategic sense of like, you know, I tried to stay with my colleague as long as I could. Once we were separated, I called her. We um, uh, met back up again and then made a plan to go get her treatment and then for me to come pick her up. So having those sorts of security plans, even in a small place um, or at a smaller uh, paper or, or news outlet, I've worked at places of all different sizes. Um, that, those plans are still helpful. Um, I should note, I've also worked in war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan, where we make those kinds of security plans routinely. I was not accustomed to having to do it here, but um, since you know covering protests, I started covering some of these kinds of um, police brutality protests at Ferguson. And since then, it, the landscape has really changed. And I think it's safe to say now, you need to plan that the police are not going to be a place where you know, prior we used to say, okay, well, I could seek shelter at a police department or I could seek shelter at a, at a hospital. Well, now with COVID and police brutality issues um, against the press, 
we really can't plan on that. But you can plan like park at a hotel parking lot, for instance, away from where the protest is and plan to seek shelter there. Great, great suggestions. Um, maybe you could also too just take a couple steps back and give us a, uh, some more detail about how these incidents play out. Um, you're a reporter, you go to the scene where there's a demonstration, a rally, a, a protest. Um, how do you go about covering that story? And then uh, how does it typically play out as far as law enforcement involvement and then bringing you to the confrontation that you had in Minnesota? Well, in some ways, it's like any other story. You really should have, I think, you really should have top of mind trying to be objective. I do still believe in objectivity. I'm trying to, to talk to a variety of people at those protests. So if if I see people, like in Minneapolis, I did see some people who were going into stores, um, who were, uh, you know, uh, breaking windows. I did talk to some of those people too. I did photograph some of that. Um, I did want to document that, but the vast majority of the people I saw were peacefully protesting. And so I concentrated on covering that, but not just, you know, randomly picking people or picking people who are the easiest to talk to. Uh, I would try to, to talk to people of different races, different ages, people who had different insignia on. Some people were wearing all black, which sometimes is associated with Antifa or anarchists, but I would go up and ask them what their political affiliation was, why they came to protest. And it wasn't always what you would assume it was. I did try to take a lot of photos to tweet a lot in real time because then I would, it also helped legitimize me as a journalist to go and show someone, look, this is who I am and this is how I'm covering this event right here. So you can know, what I'm going to be reporting on you. And also, I would refer them to the website. I would say, I'm going to be updating this regularly so you can see it. And if your outlet doesn't do that, you can still do it on your own social media if, if your outlet is okay with that, which most of them I would think would be. And it also becomes a really cool Twitter threads or another really cool way to tell a story, which I'm always looking for, for. And I think we all are looking for new ways to tell stories and go beyond sometimes even the limits of a smaller uh, outlet. Um, and it, Minneapolis was the first place for me, and I know for other people it's been Portland or, or even back to Charlottesville, where the police, I had assumed if I acted strategically like I described earlier, I was in a certain part of the protest, I had a, an escape route planned, there was a brick wall we were sheltered against with kind of a niche in it where we figured the protesters were on this side, the police were on this side, we, we were in this niche to the side, we figured the police would just sweep by us and then we'd be behind the police and we could be you know documenting. Well, instead of sweeping by us, the, a, a portion of the police broke off and turned on us and were just shooting at us, on us. Um, we were in a big pile, literally a pile. I was at the bottom, so I was pretty, um, uh, was safer than the other guys, literally men and cameramen who were on top of me, but I was kind of getting crushed. I'm a, as you can see, big girl. So uh, I could take it for a while, but then it was like, well, we have to move and the, the police, you could hear it in the footage later, them shouting, move, move, but they weren't saying where. So you can't count on the police to even give you directions of where you're supposed to legally go. I was shouting at them where and they weren't responding. So then we just started running and they, instead of just letting us go and shooting the tear gas from a distance, they pursued us. That's why I got shot on the leg so many times, five, at least five times uh, as I was running. And then we came up against another brick wall. It was about four, four and a half feet tall. I went back to the scene afterwards to document all this. And the photographer I was with, she had a black vest on. And I believe, uh, I don't think she had a helmet at that point, but she had a black vest on, which was weighing her down. And she's much shorter than me. I'm five foot 11. I tried to scale the wall the first time I couldn't. The second time someone helped me and I got over. But Carolyn, my coworker, could not get over, partly also because she was blinded by the by the pepper spray. So you can't always count on, even if you're physically fit, being able to escape. Um, and that was one of the hardest things was that I started to run and I stopped and I turned back and I was shouting, Carolyn, Carolyn. And it was all, you know, hazy from the tear gas and there were more police coming and shooting. And I had to just go and I left her and I sought shelter in a nearby building um, where I was able to charge my phone. I immediately recorded a, a video and posted it on Twitter and sent it to my um, employee, my editors letting them know very like calmly, you can see it's on my Twitter account, describing everything that had happened to me up to that point and where I was, again, as evidence um, that also is in the public realm. So even though we're not a party to that ACLU suit, it was able to be used by the ACLU as evidence is my understanding. Um, and then I called Carolyn and I, uh, a neighbor actually picked up her phone because she was lying on the ground a block from where she admit the police had thrown her over that wall. 
and the neighbor was helping her and was another neighbor was rinsing out her eyes and this neighbor answered the phone. I was able to have a, a good Samaritan in that building where I was arranged to drive us to that house where we met up and then another good Samaritan drove us to a hospital where Carolyn got treated. I didn't go in because of COVID and we, I, I'm assuming we're gonna talk about that more later. Um, I, I didn't get treatment until I got back to Houston a week later. I kept reporting and just treated myself uh, because I didn't wanna, I had covered COVID enough to know that I didn't wanna be in um, an uh, emergency room. It sounds like going into these situations document as much as you can, let everyone know, uh, you know, of your presence. Um, and, and I guess it comes down to many times just, just improvising and making very quick, you know, spur of the moment decisions about what is the, the safest thing to do. You can't just simply, you know, hold up a copy of the constitution in the, you know, in front of a police officer and say, hey, my first amendment rights, you know, you really have to react to the circumstances as they well, unfold. And I did want to note one thing, which is that I have since covered um, protests in Kenosha in Wisconsin, in, in Louisville, Kentucky. And also I covered the, the first Trump rally in Tulsa where there were counter protests and, um, and some clashes with police with, with pepper balls. And I tried to go into those with an open mind. I mean, I was more wary of the police, but I did um, uh, what I've been told to do in some trainings, which is seek out a commander or someone who seems to have rank or seems to be in charge before, um, you know, like early on in the protest or when you first show up or if things get a little bit heated or you're seeing things get heated, I sought them out. Um, I asked for like a number for the PIO or I had looked it up or I talked, I asked, you know, is there someone I can call if, if, if something happens um, or to check about injuries or, or crowd stats or something. And um, uh, the police there in Tulsa and in Louisville, I didn't have this in Kenosha, but they were much more responsive um, both to me and treating me like a normal reporter in the way I was used to police treating me having covered the police beat. Um, and uh, also, I mean, it was helpful to the reporting to be able to have those numbers and stuff and also to just chit chat with police and kind of get an insight because I have to, I don't, you guys may be more covering, I'm um, like, Tara, you might be covering um, police you already know or have covered on the beat. Um, and I do that, I do that here in Texas where I'm based. When I'm parachuting in, it's like, it helps to get to know who, who do I need to know at the police department. And they were very helpful. So every jurisdiction wasn't the way Minneapolis was. But, um, but to date, Minnesota State Patrol has never apologized. The Minneapolis mayor and the governor of Minnesota both clearly said, the mayor said it in a phone call to me the day after that um, press were exempt from the curfew and, and what they did was illegal. So um, that agency is believes are above the law. But these other ones, um, I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. That's good to hear. Now, Tara, you had a, an interesting experience being arrested by the very police department that you cover day to day. Can you take us back to last year and tell us what exactly happened? Sure. So, yeah, I had been working in Bridgeport at the time for about two years um, and covering the Bridgeport Police Department and breaking news for Hearst, Connecticut for about two years. Um, and early on in my career, I actually covered a fatal police shooting there in Bridgeport. Um, and on the two year anniversary of that shooting, I had gone out and covered a demonstration. I had actually gone back to the newsroom, filed the story, our photographer filed his photos. Um, I kind of thought everything was done for the night. You know, I had a couple hours left in my shift. I was just hanging around doing my usual stuff. And then I heard things start getting crazy on the radio. So I headed back out there. I called our photographer, he headed there. Um, by the time we both got there, things had settled. He took a couple pictures. Things seemed calm enough that I told him that he didn't need to stick around. I knew he had more stuff he had to do. And I was just gonna talk to a couple protesters, find out what happened and head back myself. Um, and you know, I wish I knew at the time that less than 10 minutes later, I'd be in handcuffs or I definitely wouldn't have told him to leave. Um, I was about halfway between police and protesters. Um, each had kind of their own spot on the road and I was standing over on the sidewalk and I just had my phone out. I was filming, um, doing a lot on Twitter. I had like a thread going that night and I was actually filming when the police had um, given protesters a five minute warning to clear the street or they would start making some arrests. And that five minutes passed and I ended up being about the second or third person that they grabbed and handcuffed. Um, 
And like, you know, most other reporters who got arrested covering the protest this year, you know, I ID'd myself. I said I was the press. I had credentials around my neck. I had a notebook tucked under my arm and a pen. Like those were literally the only things on what they would later fill in on my prisoner inventory sheet was notepad and I think headphones maybe. Um, but, you know, regardless, they arrested me. Um, and, you know, it wasn't rookie cops who arrested me, not that that would be an excuse, but it was two sergeants who arrested me while a deputy chief who I had been in the room with several times and definitely met several times walked right by and we would actually later see on body cam footage that he looked directly at me and at those two sergeants cuffing me and just kept walking and, you know, did nothing as I'm shouting that I'm the press. Um, but, you know, it's it's moments like that that just make it so clear that it, it is a dangerous job and can be a dangerous job. And, you know, it's, it's important to remember how to keep ourselves protected. And, you know, situations can head south so quickly that it's important to always have that in the back of your mind. For sure. And, uh, and, and Molly mentioned that after, um, after the incident that occurred to her, she couldn't even get an apology from police officials. Um, was that the case with you, Tara? What happened after your arrest? Was there any kind of reconciliation or uh, you know, tell us what, what, what happened as far as your relationship with uh, the police department moving forward? So that night in booking, um, they had me in custody for about 45 minutes or an hour. Um, and while they were uncuffing me actually is when the sergeant who started arresting me, the initial arresting sergeant, um, apologized, explained that he didn't hear me saying I was press. You know, he said it was tense. And, it, it, you know, to me, it seemed genuine whether or not he actually realized in that situation. You know, I, I put a little bit more of the fault on the deputy chief and, you know, just the situation overall. But um, from higher ups, you know, I as I was headed back to my newsroom after being released that night, I got a call from the mayor. Um, you know, he, of course, apologized. And uh, we ended up getting a formal letter addressed to a former editor, um, not addressed to me at all, apologizing for the arrest from, I believe it was the police chief. Um, and I'm not sure if there was anyone else, it might have just been the chief on that, um, on that letter, but, or excuse me, former chief. Um, but so that that was really the only you know, official higher up apology from within the police department. Um, I know a lot of agencies wrote letters to the police department on, you know, in support of me saying that the police short should, you know, meet with us, we should discuss it. Um, and we, we asked a couple times if we could sit down with people, but, you know, nothing ever really came of it. What about your relationship now moving forward with the department? Because you still have to cover these same police officers that arrested you. You didn't just uh, show up one day to cover the protests, but you're a familiar face within the community. The police department knows you. They know now that you've been uh, arrested. You've had this experience. How, if at all, has that affected your ability uh, to cover the community as a journalist for Hearst? Um, so just personally, it was it was kind of awkward going back into covering even just normal crime scene stuff, um, because just as normal practice, I would try to talk to whatever officers were standing the crime scene line. And I that usually starts with me introducing myself. And before getting arrested, I'd say my name and they'd say, oh, maybe I've seen your stuff in the paper. And now I say my name and it's kind of that awkward. Oh, you're that person, you know. Um, so it's, it's kind of that unspoken elephant in the room where we usually don't talk about it, but it's very clear, you know, um, but thankfully, um, you know, I, I think we've kind of just powered through it, um, kind of okay with being in denial that it happened just to get the job done. But, you know, it, it's, it's kind of always in the back of my mind, at least, you know, still when I talk to officials or sit down with you know, people in that police department, it's, it's always going to be in the back of my mind, you know, that their officers arrested me when I was just trying to do what I do every day is just cover them and cover everything else that's happening. For sure. 
Now, Dan, I'm going to get to you in just a moment to talk about the, the legal underpinnings to these types of uh, scenarios that reporters find themselves in. But Stephanie, if I could go back to you for just a moment, um, having heard the experiences of Molly and, and Tara, are, are these experiences the are these experiences the, uh, the the typical ones that you hear when you're documenting uh, threats to press freedoms, or are there others that you've encountered uh, through your work at the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker? Yeah, so they're definitely not uncommon. At least they haven't been over the past year. We have a tragic number of journalists who were not even embedded with the protesters who were very clearly standing off to the side as both Molly and Tara were just documenting the scene who then are targeted directly, regardless, without passing judgment or ascertaining like specifically whether or not they were targeted in the knowledge that they were journalists. But we do have a number of cases where as uh, Molly mentioned, Linda Tirado is a reporter, a photojournalist who lost her eye while reporting in Minneapolis uh, while she was shooting. And we have other journalists who were shot in the hand that they were using to hold up their press pass. And so it, it's happening more and more often. And it's been particularly concerning to see, we have a couple of new incidents involving journalists who are covering celebrations in Los Angeles with the Dodgers winning and the Lakers winning, where now the LAPD appears to just be using the excessive use of force as the default. And now journalists who may have been going out to just document what they believed was going to be a celebratory moment are actually caught up in the same level of aggressive tactics that veteran reporters who've been covering the Black Lives Matter movements have maybe become more attuned to are coming in with helmets and the other appropriate gear that is deemed necessary. So unfortunately, yes, their, their stories are all too common at this point. That's unfortunate. Um, and, and it sounds like, you know, in the, the, the heat of the moment, you know, uh, waving the First Amendment banner isn't going to provide you much protection, but perhaps after the fact, it would. Dan, can you help us understand where some of the lines are as far as First Amendment protections for journalists in these cases where they're out in public areas covering uh, covering news stories that have significant public interest, but either are targeted by law enforcement or treated as uh, protesters might be and told to leave an area that maybe they have every right to remain in. Sure, um, and thank you again for having me. Um, just before we go into the legal framework, just two general caveats. One, you know, these are legal principles uh, that, that in, in theory govern what you'll see but you know, I think that you know, as we've just heard, you may in the moment find that there are safety considerations that override you know, your thought about what your theoretical legal rights are. And of course, you know, we would always encourage people to take that into account and to you know, act in a way that's gonna protect your safety. Um, you know, the second thing I would just say is that, you know, again, these are general principles. And you know, if there are questions about your specific situation, any, any of the viewers specific situation, we would always encourage people you know, to speak with an attorney about you know, what I'm going to do or what just happened to me specifically um, and to get legal advice if, you know, if they have questions. Um, you know, in terms of First Amendment rights, you know, as a journalist or as a, as a citizen, you know, these are a broad set of rights to collect and disseminate information, um, particularly about matters of public concern, like the conduct of public officials, including police officers. And, you know, there are classes in law school where you could take a whole semester to talk about the whole scope of these rights and how they, they play out in the world. I think for, for these purposes, there's probably three things I would, I would just briefly address, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Um, first being the right to record the police, which I, I imagine is typically the situation where people find themselves coming into contact with police and, and potentially being victimized, uh, like we've just heard. Um, second being, you know, what are some of the general principles if you're stopped or arrested by the police? And you know, third, what can you do if you've been victimized in other ways, for example, if you've been the victim of excessive force? which it sounds like is you know, unfortunately becoming increasingly common. Uh, the ACLU nationally and its affiliates, I, I work at the, the Massachusetts affiliate of the ACLU, uh, we're litigating a variety of issues around these, uh, these types of cases. And so you know, I, I hope that this is a general sort of introduction, but you know, if you have questions, again, I'd encourage people to, to contact an attorney 
you know, including at the ACLU. Um, you know, here in, in Massachusetts and in the First Circuit, which encompasses most of New England, uh, we are actually pretty fortunate in terms of the, the clarity about the, what the First Amendment allows reporters to do with respect to recording the police. Um, there was a case from 2011 uh, called Glick. Um, and in that case, it was a gentleman uh, who was not actually a reporter who was walking through a public park, saw police officers effectuating an arrest, and took out his phone from about 10 feet away and recorded the police officers while they did that. Uh, the police officers then arrested Mr. Click, charged him with crimes. Uh, those charges were dropped and he later brought a civil suit essentially alleging that he was wrongfully arrested, that he had a First Amendment right to record these officers you know, who were conducting their duties in public. And the First Circuit held in that case, uh, the Court of Appeals for our circuit, that there is a right to openly record police officers who are performing their duties in public subject to certain reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And so breaking that down a little bit, so record, right, there's a right to record, and that means audio or visual. Uh, it's a right to openly record, which means that uh, the device you're using to record would have to generally be in plain sight. So like a camera on your shoulder or a phone that you're holding up, you know, which gives notice to the police officers that they're being recorded. Um, and it's openly recording police officers who are performing their duty in a public place. So that could mean in a park, it could mean on a sidewalk, uh, it could even mean in a public area of a building inside, uh, but the government would probably argue in some of these cases that, you know, for example, the private area of a government building, you know, in the back where the offices are, where the public is not allowed, you know, that that might be outside the scope of this right. So it's a right to publicly record, uh, to openly record police officers performing duties in public. And that's something that the First Amendment protects. Like many First Amendment rights, there are certain uh, limitations. Um, and here it's been articulated as um, a potential for limiting it through reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And the exact scope of what that means has not yet been defined by the courts in our circuit. But the government would probably assert several different scenarios where that might come up. So one would be a scenario where the journalist or, or other person who's recording is, is physically interfering with the police officer who's trying to execute their duties. So in Glick, the person who was recording was 10 feet away. And that was found to be protected by the First Amendment. Um, but if that person had been two inches away from the police officer and was, you know, had their camera in their face so that they couldn't see what they were doing, uh, the police officer might have taken steps to stop the recording. Um, and then the government might have argued, well, that's a reasonable restriction because otherwise there's interference in the police officer's performance of his duties. Um, another argument the government might make is that it's, it's appropriate to move people to prevent a threat to public safety or to police officer safety, and that that might be reasonable. And in that case, that might incidentally affect the recording uh, being done by a journalist who is in the crowd that is being moved. And I think the government there would argue, well, in that case, uh, that's another re reasonable restriction you know, if there's a threat to public safety or officer safety presented by that crowd. And then um, there also are some other potential arguments that are less likely to come up. The government might argue that there are pre-existing statutes or ordinances that restrict uh, the presence or activities of people that might uh, you know, incidentally restrict recording. Um, and there also is the possibility of things like if a police officer is talking to a confidential informant, they might argue that, well, if you're there recording that, you've now disclose the identity of that confidential informant and they, they don't want that, so they might ask you to stop recording. You know, instances where the collection of the information uh, you know, might have some damaging effect on law enforcement activity. So you know, we at the ACLU do not necessarily agree that these are all reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, but the government is likely to assert that those types of uh, events could constitute reasonable bases to restrict uh, a journalist or other person from recording uh, the activities of the police in public. Um, that's, that's about open recording. Uh, there is also a question about secret recording that we sometimes get, and that's a different question. So that would be recording not with a device that's visible to the police, uh, but with a device that's somehow hidden so that the person doesn't know they're being recorded. For example, you know, maybe it's in a bag or something where, where the officer wouldn't see it. Um, and if you have a situation where you're contemplating doing some type of secret recording, I would very much encourage you to talk to an attorney about your specific plan before you do it. Um, and the reason for that is there are statutes in some states that purport to criminalize certain types of secret recording. And there is currently an open question about whether the First Amendment might override that to, to a certain extent 
uh, and um, authorize secret recording of police and public. But that's a question where uh, a trial court in Massachusetts has ruled that yes, uh, the First Amendment does authorize secret recording in some circumstances, uh, but that's on appeal and it could be changed on appeal. So I, I think basically there, there is some uncertainty about what the First Amendment exactly uh, protects in that circumstance. And so because there's some potential for criminal exposure, I, I would very much encourage people contemplating secret recording to speak to an attorney before they do it. Um, so Dan, if I could uh, cut in just with a, a question regarding uh, the right to record, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I can often see this play out, uh, you have uh, a reporter who's you know openly recording, uh, not secretly recording, but openly recording, and is told by police, you know, stop recording me, or worst case, uh, give me your camera. So here we are talking about the protection of journalists themselves, but I think there's also the question of protecting journalists' work. Under what mm -hmm. circumstances, if any, can law enforcement force an individual, a journalist or otherwise, to stop recording them, or uh, in other cases, confiscate their their camera outright? So that, I think that's a great question. And I think um, you know, it goes to sort of the heart of what you might see if you are being stopped or detained by law enforcement. You know, traditionally, there's really two ways that the police can detain you and then take some type of action against you. So one would be what would be often called a stop, which is where they have some reasonable suspicion of criminal activity and they're stopping you briefly in, in your location on the street uh, to have a conversation with you. Um, the other would be an arrest, which is you know, typically where they have uh, probable cause to believe a crime has committed has been committed, and there they would bring you, you know, back to a police station. So if they if they stop you, um, they may stop you. They may pat you down if they believe there's a, a reason to for officer safety. Um, the first thing I think you can always ask is, am I being detained or am I free to leave? And if the answer is yes, you are free to leave, then you may leave. Um, if the answer is no, you are not free to leave, then you are now being detained. Um, once you're being detained uh, and before, even if you are free to leave, you always have a right to remain silent. I think that's important for people to remember. Um, you don't have to have a conversation with the officer. Um, and in terms of your phone, there's a few important things there. The officer may demand or may take your phone or other recording device. Now, there may be an argument that that's illegal. The government would probably contend, well, I have to do it to preserve evidence. That's been an argument that's been made uh, frequently. Because um, if I don't take it, you know, it'll be deleted before I get a warrant. Um, you know, and there are arguments that that's, that's not correct, that, that that's not proper. But I mean, fundamentally, I think in the moment, if the officer takes your phone, the officer has your phone. Um, beyond that, you know, the officer may ask you to unlock your phone, right? You know, please unlock it. And that'll depend on what the unlocking feature you have enabled on your phone is, right? If you have a code that unlocks your phone, you are not required to give the officer that code. However, if your unlocking feature is face recognition, then it doesn't really matter what you want to do because the officer will just point it at your face and now is inside your phone. So, you know, we would encourage people to consider using the code instead of face recognition on their phone. Um, similarly, fingerprint, right? The officer can take your finger, apply it to the phone, and now the officer's in your phone. So that uh, is another reason why using the code may be preferable, you know, so that if you're stopped, you, know, you maintain control. Um, additionally, the officer might ask you to delete information from your phone. And you know, I think our view is that there is no law that allows officers to demand that you delete any information from your phone. Um, you know, and generally speaking, uh, whatever is on the phone, if the officer thinks it's evidence of something, it should be preserved, not deleted. In any event, we don't think there's any authorization for the officer to demand that you delete it. So you know, I know people have had that experience sometimes, and I think that that's something where uh, that can be declined. Um, if you are, uh, I guess one other point I would make is, if the officer just merely asks for your phone, that's another situation where you should definitely um, ask if, you're, if you have a choice. Because if the officer says, yes, you have a choice, then you could say no. If the officer says you do not have a choice, you have to give your phone. Well, you know, I think that you should not physically resist the officer, but you should make it clear that you are not consenting to the officer taking your phone. So you can always say, you know, I'm, yes, I'm, a, I'm complying, but I do, not, I do not agree. I do not do this voluntarily. I do not consent. Um, so I think that's important as well. Um, if you're arrested, you know, you're likely to be taken back to the station. At that time, you know, they'll do a, a, an inventory. They can do a search incident to arrest, an inventory, the possessions that are on you at that time. Um, and again, at that point, your phone probably will be taken from you if you're arrested. Um, 
And I would just say for those who are arrested, remember, you always have a right to remain silent. Uh, you know, people often get themselves into difficulties by speaking to the police, uh, especially if they're trying to talk themselves out of trouble. Uh, and so I would encourage people to consider remaining silent if they've been uh, arrested. And you have a right to counsel, right? You have a right to be, it's, this is the Miranda rights we all see uh, on, you know, on television. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, ask for an attorney. Um, now, you may want to engage an attorney in advance before you go into a situation where you think you might be exposed to detention or arrest. Um, and you may want to record that phone number in a place where it can't be taken away from you. You may want to write that on your arm uh, or, or somewhere where you will always have access to it so that if you, if you have the situation where you need the lawyer, uh, you will know how to contact that person. Great, uh, great suggestion. I, I like that writing phone number right on your arm so it literally cannot be taken away from you in the uh, case of arrest. Um, let's 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 stay on the topic of, of uh, rest for a moment because you have many journalists that are in public areas uh, where they would otherwise be entitled to be covering a story not posing any kind of public security risk but are still being told to get out of the area and being treated like any other member of the public uh, are there any laws or does the first amendment you know protect the reporter in that case to be distinguished from everyone else and be allowed to stay where they are and continue reporting the story? That's a, a, a really important question. And I think to some extent it's situational. Um, you know, there, if, if you are being asked to leave voluntarily, you know, there are situations where, you know, I think the reporters have a first amendment right to be present in public, in a public space to record what's going on, you know, just what I've just been talking about. And so I think that it's, you know, I think it's important to uh, you know, consider remaining, you know, but my sense is, and I'm not a reporter, so I don't deal with this routine, but my sense is usually you're not just being asked, usually you are being moved out using some type of force, where it's not really up to you whether you're going to go or not. Uh, it's basically a question of are you going to walk away or are you going to get shot with a, uh, a pepper pellet or a rubber bullet or hit with a baton. And so, you know, in that circumstance, of course, it's, a, it's an individual judgment, I think, about maintaining your safety. And I think in that circumstance, it then becomes, assuming you leave one way or the other, it becomes a question of uh, what can be done afterwards to ensure that that does not happen again. And that's something that you know, the ACLU has been litigating, um, you know, including in places like Portland uh, and other places where there have been violence against reporters or they've been you know, moved forcibly by police. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways I think that reporters have their rights violated. Some can be um, not being given access to certain areas, uh, some can be, you know, being victimized uh, by violence. You know, I think we just heard, um, you know, that you know, police using uh, projectile weapons indiscriminately, police using uh, batons indiscriminately. Um, you know, those are all things that may give rise to a variety of legal challenges uh, that may be able to prevent that activity from recurring, either under the First Amendment or under other parts of the Constitution uh, or under other state and federal laws. So. You know, if someone is, is, if a person who is a reporter is moved forcibly or involuntarily, I would encourage them to immediately contact uh, an attorney, including at the ACLU uh, or um, at your organization uh, or, you know, other, other organizations that, that work on civil rights issues. And, you know, I think at that point, you know, litigation can often be implemented at a very quick pace to try to prevent that from happening again, you know, the next day or two days later. Thank you. Yeah, no, there are certainly many resources out there for uh, journalists that are dealing with these issues after the fact to get some kind of remedy. Uh, but Molly, I'd like to go back to you just as a, a, a logistical matter. Um, you know, you were tear gassed, you were shot at. Is there anything you would do differently to better protect yourself if faced with that same situation again? Any suggestions that you might have for those uh, specifically that are going into communities that they don't normally cover and might face the type of experience that you had in Minnesota. Yeah, thanks for asking. And um, and thanks to the other panelists for all this insight. I'm learning things um, and thinking about things differently just from this conversation. I did want to note um, before we get into that, that my experience, um, this is a kind of a no brainer, but here we are all on this panel and we are not people of color. My experience was um, very different from uh, reporters of color, with black reporters and, and other reporters of color um, on my own, uh, at my own news organization and others. 
Um, there was a CNN reporter uh, who was attacked the same night, I, or I'm sorry, I should say that, that he was out there covering things around the same time I was, he got arrested, I didn't. Um, and and it, he was arrested on camera uh, and, and members of his crew. And he talked about that later. Um, other uh, people, uh, reporters I know have been pulled over um, in communities where I was never pulled over while I was working. So I think that's something else for people to keep in mind. I was on a, a panel with um, some other, you know, reporters, reporters of color in LA. One of them had been um, taken into one of those cordoned off areas and arrested and zip tied at one of these protests. And a colleague at another uh, news organization went over and showed the police her coverage online and verified that she was a journalist and got her released. And I was just really impressed by that. Um, and, and it gave me the idea that we can actually serve as, as advocates and allies to each other in those situations. Um, and, and so that's something I wanted to, to plan out there. But then another panel I was on, one of the panelists, an African-American woman in California was saying it really scared her having these experiences and she wasn't sure she wanted to keep covering it. And I kept talking to her afterwards and said, you know, it's your own personal decision, but I really hope that you do and that you don't let this scare you. Because um, back to your original point, um, I didn't seek treatment immediately because of concerns about COVID and because I felt like I wasn't that as badly injured as my colleague who literally could not see. Um, but uh, I, I did continue reporting and I wrote some stories that I'm really proud of in that ensuing week. And also I felt like it was really important to, to send the message. We're not gonna let you shut us up. You know, we're not gonna let you incapacitate us because it felt like that was the purpose. Take, taking us out of, removing us from the scene, not letting us do our jobs and putting the fear in us. So what I did do was exactly what you said, which was recalibrate and say, okay, my next trip I believe was when I went to Tulsa and, and I was thinking, okay, how can I more strategically approach this? I got the equipment beforehand. Um, I learned how to use it, which is a whole other thing. Um, you don't have to get a gas mask, you might get a respirator or just have masks, but making sure that you're using them correctly, doing fit tests and things like that with enough lead time. We have lead time now ahead of the elections and whatever kind of protests we're gonna face. Um, so to make sure you do that and make time to do that, I'm doing that now uh, again. Um, but then also, you know, playing out scenarios of, well, what am I gonna do if the police are friendly? And I did that, I approached them and gave them the benefit of the doubt. If they aren't friendly, well then what is my option then? Um, another point that was made to me in one of the security trainings was to go out the night before, the day before, if you have time and just scope out the area. Not just, you know, checking for exits and routes like that, but just seeing what all your different options are. If you know there's gonna be multiple protests in different places, well, what's the distance? Which is the one you really wanna to go to? Do you wanna just like, in Tulsa there were two protests and I ended up deciding I'm just gonna stay at the one that was by the arena where Trump was gonna be because I didn't wanna be shuttling back and forth. I wanted to conserve energy and really focus on one spot. And I think that was the best decision. Um, late in the night when the protests got pretty heavy and they were having clashes with police, I backed off more than I would have prior on a side street. I had my helmet on. Um, and then when it got a little calmer, I went forward. I could smell the pepper in the air, but I didn't assume it was pepper spray. It turned out it was pepper balls. I had got that because I talked to other reporters. And then I also talked to protesters, several protesters to verify it. Now, is that as good as seeing it with your own eyes? It's debatable. And we're going to have a meeting with editors um, later this week to talk about stuff. And I've already raised that issue with them. If we, If you don't give your reporters and photographers adequate equipment, I don't think we can be expected to be right up in the thick of where things are happening. And you'll get a different story because you won't get that eyewitness account of what's happening, which personally, I would like to have that in the era of fake news to be able to, to testify and, and bear witness to it and say, this is what actually happened. Um, if there's a photographer there, I'll let them do that and I'll back off and then we'll confer afterwards and I'll write stuff down and say, well, what did you see? And let me describe it. And I'll give them credit on the story. I think that's a better division of labor and I'll be off talking to people. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it, it does. And uh, to go back to one of your earlier points and one that I really think needs emphasizing is that uh, there's there are opportunities here for journalists of all different organizations, even competing organizations to help each other out and really serve as allies and, and to cooperate and collaborate in ways which will make everyone's coverage stronger. And um, I, I, I think 
uh, that really should be encouraged, um, you know, as you mentioned, and, and something for everyone to consider. Uh, another consideration too, and, and you brought it up, um, is COVID. We've talked a lot about law enforcement and the uh, threats to individual uh, safety that police officers may pose during these types of demonstrations. Um, but you also have uh, the threats of a pandemic and uh, COVID on all the journalists' mind when they're going into communities and they're going on site and they're around many different people all at once. Uh, do you have any suggestions there for what uh, we can do to protect ourselves beyond wearing a mask? Is there anything that we should be considering before uh, joining um, or covering a, a protest with hundreds if not thousands of people present? Sure. Well, and I didn't note this uh, earlier. I live in Texas. I have lived in various states. I've been here almost a decade, but I lived in California for five years. I've lived in Florida and North Carolina. I'm from upstate New York originally. Um, my father's side of the family is from New England. I went to school in Boston. So um, I enjoy working in all different parts of the country, but they are very different environments, especially during the pandemic. So you had mentioned um, earlier that um, some journalists had been retaliated against um, or attacked for, for wearing masks. I have not been attacked, but I've certainly had comments uh, here in Texas and Louisiana and, and some other states from people who do not believe in COVID, who think it's a hoax, or um, the way a lot of people put it is that it's, it's been overhyped or overplayed, that it's like the seasonal flu. Um, I am very interested in covering COVID. I used to be the healthcare reporter at the, the LA Times in LA. Um, I had covered uh, 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 swine flu, H1N1 um, in LA. So um, I have covered COVID in COVID units. I've been inside hospitals and I try to tell people and spread the word. It is very much real and scary. Um, and I always wear a mask. I try, luckily my employer has provided us with some N95 masks. Before that, I would just save masks that I'd been um, provided at hospitals where I covered stories and then reuse them every uh, about five days. Um, I'm sorry, every three days. But, um, uh, uh, yeah. So, and I also am lucky enough that we can get tested for free here in Houston, and I make use of that, especially when I travel if I go on a plane. Um, but in terms of covering things like Tulsa, for instance, um, I went early, um, if you'll recall, it was um, the rally that coincided with Juneteenth. So I wanted to cover, it got delayed a day, but it was still Juneteenth weekend. So I wanted to cover the Juneteenth celebration and the rally. But I even went a couple days early just to scope out the, the sort of territory. Um, I'd been to Tulsa before, but I hadn't been to that, that part of town. And, um, and people were camped out to, to attend the, the Trump rally. And I went out to talk to them too, of course, um, as well as going to Black Wall Street, which is an amazing place. Um, and when I went to, to the line, almost no one was wearing masks. And it would have been very easy for me to not wear a mask, but I felt like it was important. So um, I did wear a mask then. I wore a mask um, when the rally was going on. And some people would, would ask me about it, but there were also some people who were wearing masks and I would ask them, well, the ones who weren't, do you plan to wear them inside? And some of them did plan to wear them inside. And so we'd have a conversation about that. And there were even some Trump supporters in face shield. So um, I wouldn't say it was, it was everyone was denying COVID, but it became a part of the reporting, obviously. Um, but I feel like you have to have your own personal standards of what you want to do. And to me, it's the best mask you can possibly get. And I really would encourage people to try to get your organizations to provide you with N95s, especially if you're covering protests. I have KN95s also that I bought. They are just not as good. I did a fit test um, where you, you know, spray a spray on your face kind of, and you can totally tell the difference. It's very dramatic. Um, I know they're hard to get, but I, I think it's really important. And what about the individuals that are making the comments, uh, as you mentioned? Uh, how do you respond to that? Do you ignore them? Do you try to educate them? Do you de-escalate the situation so you make well, sure- Well, sometimes, that you know, if the comments are funny, like I remember I was covering Hurricane Laura in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and a guy, uh, I came over to, to talk to a couple of people and the guy said, what's that on your, you have something on your face, you know? And so as my mother often says, humor can be a great way of diffusing uh, situations, but we all know that as, as journalists. Um, I, I, one thing I have done is I road trip a lot. I road trip more during the pandemic to cover things and I have, I have ceased stopping at certain places. Um, I love Bucky's. I'm a, a Texas girl now, and I love Bucky's. If you know what that is, it's a, a roadside stop. And um, people were just not practicing good masking there. There were kids running all over the place, people walking around coughing. Um, and I just won't go there anymore. And it's sad, but 
I really just, um, I only want to, you know, measure the risks. There was a story I was covering a Pentecostal church outside of Baton Rouge that um, refused to wear masks. And the first time I went there to do a story, I did go in the church and I believe I wore a mask. I'm trying to remember it was early in the pandemic. I think it might've been March. Um, and they loved that I had gone inside because a lot of reporters would not go inside. And I got a lot of credit with them. And the pastor, um, Tony Spell, stayed in real good contact with me because I had been nice and heard them out and didn't condemn them. Um, they felt really persecuted. But when I went the next time, I um, the next couple of times, actually, I did not go in. And he was kind of troubled by that. But um, I think I, I might have gone into the vestibule or stood by the door, but I did not go into the sanctuary. And uh, they had had at least one member die at that point of COVID. Um, and I just had to be honest and say, look, you know, I can't, I, I'm not immunocompromised is the other issue. I mean, there's a lot of reporters who have, or relatives who are immunocompromised and that's really serious. And I totally respect if people um, cannot do these stories. I know a lot of people really want to do protest coverage and can't. And I hope that as news organizations, we can do a better job of giving people, I was just talking to a colleague about this, giving people um, the opportunity to participate in this coverage without having to be on the front lines and risk their health or their families. But I'm lucky that I'm not in that position. But I, um, in terms of reasoning with people, I don't, I mean, I don't, I just don't feel like anyone has really, I'm trying to think if anyone has confronted me about it. No one has said like, I'll only talk to you if you remove your mask. You actually, you know what I always say? What I'll always say is this is more for your protection than mine. I've been traveling. I'm a reporter. I talk to a lot of people. So I'm wearing this, you know, for your protect or for your protection too. Cause usually it's at least a KN95. So that usually kind of, it's like, I'm a little bit different than you. It's not a personal choice. Yeah, good suggestion. And it would certainly de-escalate things because you're posing it as protection for the other person and uh, might be uh, perceived as less offensive that way. And I do try to also remind people, and I, I believe that, you no, know, this is a national thing because FEMA put it out and you can even print it out. I printed it out at the start of the pandemic that FEMA considers us essential workers because there was a time when traveling, they had those the state restrictions and coming back from Louisiana to Texas, I had to, um, you had to undergo a quarantine unless you were an essential worker. And I remember getting all ready to show the, the Texas uh, Rangers, the Texas troopers that I was an essential worker and they just waved me through. They were like, oh yeah, you're a reporter, go ahead. Um, so you can also say that. And I sometimes say that I say, well, I'm traveling because people will say, well, why are you traveling? If, if you believe in the pandemic, you shouldn't be traveling and putting people at risk. And I say, well, I'm an essential worker. You certainly are. You certainly are. Tara, uh, any guidance on those essential workers, the journalists that are uh, based full time in communities and already have uh, pre existing relationships with everyone there that they're covering? Any suggestions you would provide to them to uh, stave off confrontations, unnecessary confrontations, or to uh, protect themselves from uh, threats that, you know, COVID, for example, might pose? Sure. So I think Molly went into this a bit earlier, but really getting out there and making sure if you're covering a protest, a demonstration, whatever it might be, trying to make sure that whoever is the police commander at the scene, introduce yourself to that person and make sure that that person is aware of who you are, that you are a reporter, that you have their contact information and vice versa you know, explain to them that you will be there if you've got, you know, any other crew members with you, video, photographer, other reporters, you know, let them know, make sure they know what they look like. I think that is just so important. It's something that is definitely, especially after what happened to me in the back of my mind now, you know, there will be no doubt at any future protest that I am a reporter if I have anything to say about it. Um, but, you know, just making sure even you've got your credentials, you know, and I, I know it sounds extreme, but like Daniel mentioned, it, it was also something that I came across after I got arrested was writing phone numbers on your arm. You know, it's the most basic thing. You just think if you need to call someone in a crisis, you've got your phone. But truly, when, you know, when I was in custody, I was lucky enough that they let me, you know, well, someone else had to do it for me because I had cuffs on. But, you know, they were going through my phone and, and finding my editor phone, my editor's phone numbers to call for me. Um, so, you know, in the future, I will absolutely have, you know, sharpied onto my arm every phone number I think I might need going into that situation because 
you know, truly, you never know what's going to happen. And, you know, especially the atmosphere we are in today, where you might find yourself in a confrontation, not just with police, but members of the public, you know, if there are people who perceive you as the enemy and as fake news, you know, regardless pandemic or not, you know, you can find yourself in a pretty intense situation. So I, I think, you know, beyond being a reporter, being aware of your own safety, um, you know, having those exit strategies are definitely important. Um, and, and just being aware that, of course, it's so important to tell the public whatever story you're covering, but not, not at the point where you are risking your life. And if you can, you know, move 20 feet down the street and get away from a threat, you know, you, you have to have that periphery to know, okay, I, I can still cover this if I just go 20 feet this way and, and I'm away from this threat now. Um, you know, being aware, making sure that, you know, if, if there are other reporters there that you know, you know, make sure you guys are keeping tabs on each other. Um, you know, even if it's reporters you don't know, introduce yourself and do the same. It's, it's so important that we all keep an eye on each other. And, you know, especially like Molly said, you know, I, I, I'm a white woman. I don't feel the same threats that, you know, women or men of color are feeling um, out there in the journalism world but we can be those allies. So, you know, when you're seeing something, it is so important right now that we, we speak up for each other because, you know, there are way too many attacks happening on journalists for us to just sit here and be silent and do nothing. Thank you, thank you, all great points. Uh, as we wrap up here, uh, Stephanie, if we could uh, bring you back into the conversation and uh, have you give us some ideas to what we might expect moving forward? What kind of threats do you see journalists uh, facing as we move through this uh, contentious election, as we see more protests, as we continue in most parts of the country dealing with this pandemic? Um, between all of that and perhaps some other circumstances that uh, you have in mind, you know, what are we likely to see moving forward as far as uh, journalists are concerned and their ability to report the stories they need to? Yeah, pretty much everything that you just mentioned. So with the election and the inauguration, it is extremely likely that we will see demonstrations regardless of whomever is deemed the winner of the election. So that is something to be very much prepared for, to have these sort of plans that Molly's been talking about, not only uh, for your own safety, but reporting in pairs and having a newsroom policy about if this happens, call this person. Here's the safety gear that you're going to be allowed. These are our policies in terms of what your digital security needs to be, like practice good digital security hygiene. So you're not having your phone unlocked by a police officer pointing it at your face. Um, so those are all good best practices to have in mind, um, both with the ongoing Black Lives Matter protests, but the protests that we likely will see surrounding the election, as well having this attentiveness to your risk level um, and knowing that that can change in an instant when covering cases, more, when covering anything generally in terms of the COVID surge as we go into the colder months. Know that a community member might take issue with your choice to wear a mask and might confront you about that while you're out reporting in the field, regardless of what you're doing. So to have that awareness of everything that's going on around you and to have the appropriate PPE for your own safety as well in communities that have experienced violent police brutality issues and that the, and have been having these protests, be aware of the legal procedures that is uh, the course that it's all going to follow because you are likely to see flare ups again, protests as people are rightly angry if a police officer is not charged, if they, when they're released on bail on the anniversary of events as Tara's incident took place on all of those, you need to have an editorial calendar where you're keeping an eye on those, those points of contention in time that are going to make your job even more dangerous that day than it may have been the day before. And then lastly, it's a more of a legal concern for newsrooms particularly, but also something that I think individual journalists, especially photojournalists, 
need to be aware of is we've been seeing more and more subpoenas taking place of uh, bureaus of investigation or police departments subpoenaing newsrooms in an attempt to use their footage or other news materials as evidence and the risk that that can pose to your own security and particularly with regards to journalists are increasingly being seen as agents of the police in some communities. So if you don't have a solid policy in place on how to deal with the possibility of a subpoena, it can put you at greater physical risk if the community that you're reporting in believes that you're essentially just an arm of law enforcement. So those are all considerations that people really do need to have in mind when doing this very strategic planning moving forward. Thank you. And, and I should note that uh, for any journalist, any New England journalist that does receive a subpoena, uh, I would encourage you to contact me directly at NEFAC. We have a number of attorneys on our board of directors throughout the region who can help you and give you the assistance you need. Um, but on another point, uh, Stephanie, that you mentioned, and, and I think is worth repeating, um, you know, many of these, these protests and these demonstrations that, that we're covering as journalists aren't going to be necessarily one-offs. We're going to have anniversaries of the events that prompted them to begin with. And it's really in all of our interests to plan for those anniversaries and, and to make sure, as you said, on the editorial calendar, uh, we make note and we, uh, we plan accordingly. So uh, thank you for that. Um, Dan, any uh, final words, having heard you know, from Stephanie, some things uh, that we can uh, expect moving forward, any uh, additional guidance here as we wrap up? Uh, thank you. No, I mean, I don't think I have any specific guidance. I mean, I think what I would say is that, uh, you know, we at the ACLU have tremendous respect for the job that journalists do. You know, uh, we are uh, an organization you know, dedicated to protecting rights under the Constitution. Journalism is one of the very few jobs that is explicitly protected by our Constitution. Um, you know, and we're very interested in trying to help journalists do their job and inform the public. And, you know, I think we know that right now journalists are facing really um, challenges that may be unique in the history of, of the profession in the United States, you know, both in terms of having a, a pandemic virus uh, combined with a, a government that is actively demonizing the profession and in some cases encouraging violence, I think, against the profession. So, uh, you know, I think that we are, we are very interested in doing what we can to help. And, you know, I would encourage anyone who's watching uh, who feels like their rights have been violated or that their uh, professional activities have been curtailed in a way that's inappropriate uh, to reach out either to us um, you know, either your local ACLU affiliate uh, or to other civil rights organizations, of course, to NEFAC um, and, you know, ask for guidance if you think that there's, that there's a problem. And what is the best way to do that, Dan? Is there a specific email or phone number that people can use in Massachusetts to reach you or those in your office? Yes. Uh, so if you go to our website, which is aclum.org, uh, you can find our uh, contact information. Uh, there's a web submission form. There's also a, an intake phone number. Um, and you should feel free to, to contact us that way. We have a, a full-time intake attorney um, who will review anything uh, that we receive and ensure that it reaches the right people. Great, thank you. And, and Stephanie, for those that um, would like to know more about the US Press Freedom Tracker or uh, may have been involved in incidents that they would like to report and make sure are on your radar, what is the best way for them to do so? How can they best reach you? So. You can find out all the information that you might want about the US Press Freedom Tracker at our website, which is pressfreedomtracker.us. And you can also submit incidents online through our form there, you, or email me directly at Stephanie, spelled, you'll, you can find <laughs> the normal way that you spell Stephanie, um, at freedom.press. Thank you. And uh, Molly, you have uh, you know such a, a wealth of experience here, and, and so many I think really interesting and helpful stories mm -hmm. to share. If there are journalists that would like to reach out to you uh, directly to, to talk more and learn from you, uh, would it be okay for them to uh, email you directly and begin that conversation? Sure, and my DMs are open on Twitter. Excellent. And what is your Twitter handle? And what is your email? What's the best way to reach you? Uh, my Twitter handle is at Molly HF, no hyphen, just at Molly HF. And uh, my email, the easier one is Gmail. It's just um, Molly HF, again, H like hotel, F like uh, Frank at gmail.com. Great. Thank you. And, and Tara, what is the best way to reach you if those in uh, New England would like to get 
uh, a little more uh, perspective on uh, local reporting and dealing with uh, police departments in their communities. Sure. So like Molly, my DMs are also open. Um, it's just Tara underscore O'Neill underscore and O'Neill is spelled O-N-E-I-L-L. -L. And then there's also my email, which is just T-O-N-E-I-L-L -L at Hearst, H-E-A-R-S-T, media ct.com. Excellent. And uh, again, uh, I'm Justin Silverman of the New England First Amendment Coalition. We have a number of resources for you as well. And you can email me directly at justin at nefac.org. That's Nancy Edward Frank, applecharlie.org. Uh, everyone, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and really help us work through a lot of these issues. Um, I don't need to tell any of you, but it, it's worth remembering that uh, press freedom is certainly a cornerstone of our democracy. And I thank all of you for protecting that freedom and helping journalists across New England uh, protect themselves and their work. So on behalf of everyone, uh, many thanks and uh, appreciate all that you do.